Here in the Northern Rockies, dark winter months are outlasted in basements, dens, and nooks, where kindred souls gather together to share intel, swap fly patterns, and relive the memories from seasons past. This gathering spot known locally as the February Room is the inspiration for this podcast. No matter the season, the door is always open to those with a fly fishing story to tell. Brought to you by CD Fishing USA, the North American distributor for composite development fly rods and accessories. 40 years of Kiwi ingenuity and graphite technology now available at cd-fishing.us or your local CD USA dealer. Follow us on Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook. And remember to go fishing. Here's your host, the Carnops, and this is the February Room. One of my favorite quotes about fishing is from Norman McLean from his book, A River Runs Through It. In it, he writes, as the heat mirages on the river in front of me danced with and through each other, I could feel patterns from my own life joining with them. It was here while waiting for my brother that I started this story. Although, of course, at the time, I did not know that stories of life are often more like rivers than books. But I knew a story had begun, perhaps long ago, near the sound of water. The river can be a place where our story begins, and the Mayfly Project hopes that for children in the foster system, it's a place to develop meaningful connections on the water. Welcome to the podcast, founder and executive director of the Mayfly Project, Jess Westbrook, and fly fishing guide, lead mentor of the Mayfly Project in Salt Lake City, Rebecca Granillo. Thank you guys both for joining me today. What a special, special surprise for our listeners. It's awesome to be here, Lauren. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Lauren, for having us, for sure. Because, Jess, your home waters is in the south. Yep, so we mainly fish, like, the Little Red. Uh, so that's kind of what I consider my home water, but we have some, uh, some like, stalker streams around here that I like to fish, like the uh, Little Missouri River, and then I'll also travel over to, uh, like, Hochatown, Oklahoma, and fish the Lower Mountain Fork. So those are kind of my rivers that I frequent. Yep, all the way in Arkansas, right? That's right. I haven't been in Arkansas, but as always, before we kind of go into a little bit about what the Mayfly Project is and how it came to fruition, let's start, Jess, with you with a fly fishing story. Um, so I'd probably, uh, I'll use one from a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we, we, I grew up fishing at a place called Roaring River, Missouri, uh, so I've been going there ever since I was a little kid. Um, and, uh, a couple weeks ago they had a tournament there, right? And so it was basically like, you know, how many you could catch and honor system. And, uh, you know, we had like four hours to catch fish. Well, uh, my seven year old son case entered it, uh, and he won, he caught 19 in four hours tight lining. So, um, I think that's my favorite story, uh, personally <laughs> so far is is fishing with Case and him winning that uh, competition a few weekends ago. And he'll remember that for the rest of his life. I still remember the first big catch, the, bi- the first big fish I ever caught. It was a pike. And I thought it was like, in my mind to this day, I thought it was like the biggest fish ever that's came out of this planet. And then I saw <laughs> recently the picture because it's been, you know, tucked away. And I looked at the picture and I was like, Man, that was a dink. Like, that was the smallest northern pike. But when I was little, I literally thought, like, I needed to be in some kind of wall of fame of, like, catching the largest pike. And um, it's just so funny because I'm sure he'll, in his mind, think that, like, that was the best day of his life. Oh, for sure. Which, you know, talking about having great memories on the water, that is exactly what your mission is over at the Mayfly Project and um, maybe talk a little bit about how did the Mayfly, let's talk about what is the Mayfly Project and how did it come, how did it come to fruition? Yeah, so the Mayfly Project, so we're a 501c3 organization uh, that mentors foster children through fly fishing. So basically, we mentor our kids through five sessions within a six month window and then we outfit the kids with everything they need to fly fish on their own so we give them their own fly rod their own pack their own flies everything and so as they've gone through the program they've learned you know casting knot tying conservation uh you know all these different things um and we have like a curriculum that we follow and we have badges that our kids earn and uh so yeah so it's a it's a really cool um one-to-one uh mentoring with foster children who who really need that 
And why did you decide this needed to happen? Like why fly fishing and foster? Well, like, um, you know, it was seven years ago, uh, my first son Case was born. So I guess it's almost been eight years because he, he'll turn eight on July 1st. But um, when Case was born, I started having major anxiety. So, uh, you know, I fly fish my entire life, grew up fly fishing, was a guide in Alaska, but it wasn't until eight years ago that I started using uh, fly fishing as a healing tool. So, um, you know, Case was seven days old when I had my first panic attack. And, um, you know, basically over the next six months, I, you know, I was, I was missing a lot of work. And the cool thing was, is like my bosses, I was really close with them. So they kind of knew what was going on, but I was really having a lot of anxiety and it was something that I'd never really dealt with. Um, and, uh, you know, I was missing work. I lost like 30 pounds. I mean, I looked amazing, you know, but, uh, but, it, but it wasn't healthy. Right. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, one of the, this guy who I really looked up to, his name was Chris Morris. They had a TV show uh, here in Arkansas, and um, he he I met him right before Case was born, like literally a week before Case was born. And he was you know inviting, uh, kept inviting me to go fishing. So every time I go fishing with Chris, I would notice at least for that day that my anxiety would disappear. Um, and so I was looking for a way to give back, and and I you know I I, I just I, I mentored with Project Healing Waters and done that, but it didn't really. You know, I, I couldn't connect, and so, um, you know, one Sunday uh, we were at church, and they started talking about foster kids, and I looked at my wife Laura, and I was like, "Hey, that's what I want to do is like mentor foster kids." So, um, so Laura and I started working and networking, um, you know, and at first everybody was like, "Why do you want to take kids?" You know, like they they were kind of leery of us, you know, like what do you, what are y'all wanting to do? And um, so finally got a couple kids and started working with them. Um, yeah, and so that was like 2015, and then in um, we got our 501c3 in late 2015. Uh, we met Caitlin Barnhart in uh, I think April of 2016, and she was she'd been taking some foster kids and stuff. She has a background in mental health, um, and I have a background in accounting. And my wife Laura ha- is an attorney, and so you know we kind of like you know when you put all of us together, it was kind of this. Uh, I guess I won't say dream team, but you know, kind of, we all had our niches, you know? And so, yeah. um, yeah, so I was talking to Caitlin and Caitlin was like, yeah, I think, you know, we just got our logo designed and I knew we wanted to do something, but I didn't know exactly what it was. We didn't really have like a super big plan of, you know, we're going to do five sessions. You know, it's not as it, we had an idea of what we wanted to do, but it wasn't super detailed. And Caitlin came in and she kind of had a background in, you know, writing, uh, you know, handbooks and like I said, again, dealing with foster kids. And so, yeah, so she was like, Hey, we should, we should try to do this to get, you know, try to, you know, do this on a bigger scale. And I'm like, I don't think anybody's going to think that's cool. Caitlin, like you and I are probably the only two people who would care about foster kids, you know? Um, and then, uh, we quick, quickly realized that wasn't the case. When you think about like taking care of foster, foster kids, it feels that like in order to do that, you have to do, um, you have to be a foster parent. But what's so great about this organization is that, you know, you can be within your community and help with this, with the Mayfight project. You don't need to be a foster parent with, with a foster child. You can just be um, on the outside, which Rebecca, you're the lead mentor over in Salt Lake City. Um, What, what jobs does that um, include? in your title? Oh, so many. (laughs) But I am very (laughs) fortunate, though, to have an amazing team. We've got about 15 uh, volunteers, and that's including myself. And um, responsibilities are spread across the board um, down to, you know, who's going to be helping coordinate lunch, uh, down to outreach, you know, trying to figure out how we're going to get these kids. Um, You know, during COVID, it was extremely hard. Uh, respectively mm-hmm. so and even now so um, it still can be tricky so that is like a, it's, it's a huge task you know to try to find these children um, to get them enrolled into the program but um, you know aside from those two things it, I mean we have people that kind of help pre-rig everything or kind of get the day going um, scoping out locations making sure that we're having you know enough space for us and making sure that um it, you know, we've got like transportation, 
um, all kind of coordinated. We don't necessarily transport the kids themselves, but making sure you're coordinating, you know, a lot of group of people to all get to the same place at the same time. You know, that's a little tidbit <laughs> of some of the responsibilities <laughs> we have, but it's all across the board and it's all so rewarding. And it's easy when you got an awesome team uh, that's all like dedicated and committed to the same goal. I also love that at the Mayfly project, you guys had the stages of a project from egg, nymph, a merger, the big catch. I just love that whole process because isn't that the way that fishing is learned too, right? From the beginning and then to the end. What has, have you, what is the biggest, um, have you seen like mentally, physically changes in the kids in the, with the foster program? Um, in the Mayfly project, like what are the biggest changes that you've seen in these kids? Oh, I would say it's, it's their, their shell. Um, the first day, uh, there's a lot of shells and, uh, meaning there's a lot of people closed off, um, children closed off, but by the end, it's so different. Everybody is having an amazing time. You're seeing smiles across the board we're laughing, we're joking. And sometimes they're so out of their shell, they open up to you in a way you don't expect them to. And they open up about their personal life. And um, and so I think that's like the biggest progression we see. You know, you can't learn fly fishing in five outings, but you can definitely learn what the impact that it potentially can have in your life. And these kids seem to absorb that and their attitude is, is tremendous, like it just, quite the difference from first day to the last outing. It's, it's incredible. I love that. Jess, what are your goals on these that you would like to see these kids take away from the Mayfly project? That's a really good question, Lauren. Um, so I think, uh, you know, for every kid, it's going to be different, right? Like, um, you know, we really want our kids to, um, for the time that they're with us, right, feel supported, you know, like we're always there, we always show up, um, to feel loved, you know what I'm saying, like, you know, this is a fun time, you know, for those five outings, we hope that they forget about their problems, right, like when they go back to that group home, or go back to their foster parents, um, those problems are still going to be there, right, um, but much like myself, and forgetting about my problems when I'm on the river, we hope our kids, you know, realize that we have these public lands and that they can, you know, deal with their anxiety, their stress, their PTSD, their RADS, all these different things that happen, you know, the trauma that happens from being in foster care. We hope that they're able to deal with them by using fly fishing, right? Instead of instead of doing, you know, something bad to deal with them, right? Like something destructive, uh, you know, something good like fly fishing. So, you know, uh, we always say, you know, you know, I feel like fly fishing is, is full of, you know, um, people, you know, that ha have had like a lot of hurts, habits and hangups, right? Like, you know, our veterans, you know, cancer victims, you know, all these different things, they all have, you know, PTSD, you know, trauma from, from the situations they've been in and our kids, you know, in the foster care system are no different. So we hope that they basically, you know, will pick up fly fishing. They have all the gear to do it and we hope that they deal with, you know, their anxiety, their stress um, through something good, which is fly fishing. It's one of those things that is unspoken, but any kid in the foster system is obviously going through some probably some troubling th backgrounds. And even though we don't talk about it, but I, as I told you earlier, Jess I and Rebecca, I worked on um, my senior project in college was about women in prison, particular, particularly mothers in prison. And we, um, and because of meth and um, how it affected their their children, and so a lot of those children were actually in the foster care. And you can see with the older kids just how much pain was really going through their lives and discussing about their mom because they're dealing with adult issues at such a young age. And what I liked about the Mayfly reading about um, and learning about is that it's a time on the water where all they're thinking about is catching fish. And have you seen that, Rebecca, um, for uh, when you've taken those kids on the water? Absolutely. I'd say it's almost immediate, immediate, you know, from 
the moment that they're kind of going in through the introductions with everybody and kind of getting to know their mentor, it just, their focus is completely different. And with something so new and it has so many dang layers, your mind doesn't have the opportunity to escape. <laughs> and so we definitely see it capture their minds in the funnest ways. You know, we've had kids that just like hate bugs. But by the end, they're just like in love with them. And it, it just, it does that to you. It takes you to a different place you didn't know existed and it, there's no room for anything else, um, which is, I think, part of the healing properties of it. Absolutely. You know, Jess, I was just thinking, because, you know, you're saying that, you know, this kind of foundation creating this kind of came when you had your anxiety and stress. And I'm just wondering, having a project like this, I would, I mean, does it ever, does your anxiety ever pick up just because like, oh, there's so many kids that we need to help. It's becoming overwhelming. Or is that just like, this is where your brain's like, no, I, I feel, I need, I'm feeling the vibe to get out in the water and by helping others. I'm just curious. Cause I'm like, gosh, I feel like maybe it would cause me a, a panic attack. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. Like if, if Caitlin was on here, she would like actually be laughing right now in the background for sure. Um, Cause we were, you know, um, so it's really funny, Lauren, like, um, you know, uh, obviously, right. Like, you know, dealing with 63 projects in, you know, in 32 States in the United Kingdom uh, is a lot, you know what I mean? So there are yeah. very, there are a lot of times that, um, that it, that it can be overwhelming or stressful, but, you know, I mean, truly like, you know, we have greatly mentors like Rebecca and, you know, Nils in North Carolina and all, you know, Aaron in Ohio, all these people who are, are, are actually doing the work, you know what I'm saying? I mean, it is, you know, my job, Caitlin's job, you know, Miss Debbie's job, Hannah's job to like help support Rebecca, you know what I'm saying? So like, you know, I mean, I feel like we're all in it as a team. So, you know, if I do get overwhelmed, you know, most of the time it's, you know, you can call somebody on the phone and you're like, okay, you, know, you can kind of talk through it and, you know, but, but there are times it gets overwhelming, but, you know, there's a whole bunch of us that, that make this thing go around, you know what I mean? And so like, yeah. you know, Rebecca's just as, as big of a part of this as my, as myself or Caitlin or anybody, you know what I mean? Cause she's the one, um, actually out there doing the work, um, in Salt Lake City, you know what I mean? So, I don't know. So, sometimes it has its ups and downs, I guess. But I didn't even answer the question. But, so, is you know. there a way? <laughs> so, is there, like, have you guys, like, created your own way of connecting with each other? Like, when you're like, hey, I came out here. Here's, I have this question. I'm kind of dealing with this particular f child, and I want to try and try a different method. Do you guys have a way of connecting with each other? Because you guys have chapters. We should also say you guys have this, the Mayfly Project nationally like it's everywhere yeah so we're we're in like 32 states with like 62 projects you know and so we have um lead mentor meetings uh monthly you know that are like where our lead mentors can come in and kind of talk um and you know uh we kind of have different assignments as far as like so my job is mainly like uh you know the financial piece and working with partners and gear and all this stuff and then you know caitlin and hannah and debbie are you know, really like mentor support and, you know, kind of doing all that stuff. So we all, you know, whether it's like phone call or text messages or Zoom calls, we're, we're constantly trying to communicate and make sure that everybody so feels supported. And if there are uh, questions that those get answered, you know? Yeah, I love that. Rebecca, what made you decide to become a lead mentor? That's a great question. <laughs> um, so our, our program was Shifting Hands. Um, the gal that was in charge of it before I was, was moving away. And it just touched me in a way that, you know, I, I don't really have words how to describe it, but I didn't want to see it end in our area. And so um, I decided to resume her role and continue on, you know, this program here in Salt Lake City. And um, I'm so happy I did because there's, it's an overwhelming amount of people who want to help. And, and there's so many people that want to help. And so, get, you know, have, having keeping this alive here in Salt Lake has been amazing um, to have that opportunity for not just mentees, but mentors as well. 
Well, and I remember you were saying that um, part of after COVID, the difficulty was trying to find students or sorry, finding foster um, kids. How do you go about finding foster kids? I know on the website there's a link, but how do you get the word of mouth out to these to these families or these homes? I would say Google's my best friend. <laughs> I am constantly <laughs> on the hunt for um, different organizations and group homes here throughout the entire state of Utah and trying to find the right contacts that help us get in reach with, um, you know, whether it be children that have already been adopted out of the system or are currently in the system. And um, that's kind of how you have to start is you have to kind of start from scratch. You have to start digging, making calls, um, you know, emails, uh, you name it. And then you have to follow up on all of them. And so uh, Google is definitely or any search engine is my best friend because you really just, you know, especially with a project like ours that hasn't existed for a long time and in between have this huge gap of COVID. Um, it, it's all, it's all from scratch. It's not coming from anywhere. There's no like massive database for us. We just have to, we have to put in the work <laughs> and get creative. Yeah. <laughs> Facebook. I'm all Easily. over. Yeah. I'm fucking people all over the that's place. That's like an, un- <laughs> <laughs> that's an understatement. Yeah. I was going to ask you cause it's, you guys founded the uh, Mayfly project just in 2015. So have you seen any, uh, foster kids that have, gone through the program that you still keep in touch with and they what do they say about the program yeah so we you know it seems like lauren there's there's a couple kids in every project that are just like eat up with it right like not to you know <laughs> sound too southern when i say that but um yeah i mean you know we have tons of kids who still tie who still fish like you know, I think it was it was last year I ran into a girl at the drive through at Chick Fil A, um, and she had been adopted. Um, her name, well, I'm not gonna say what her name was, but she'd been adopted out of uh, out of foster care, and she was like, "Yeah, Jess, you know, um, uh, I actually taught my my adopted parents how to how to fish, and we go fishing, you know, like almost every every weekend. You know what I mean? And so we hear stories all the time. You know, I." You know, Colorado's got several stories of, you know, the mentors walking up the river and seeing mentees from the prior year. Um, you know, we it, it is hard to keep up with the kids, Lauren, once they leave. You know what I mean? Like the state takes yeah. them every which way, you know. But, um, but we definitely know that, you know, kids are for sure still fishing. And like I said, it's, it's hard to quantify what it is. But um, we see it firsthand, you know, in our own communities, I guess. Well, there is something about the river and the water and the fly tying that obviously brings some kind of type of serenity for everybody. I mean, hence there was, you know, Norman McLean wrote a book about it. But then if you even look even further, I mean, there's, you know, Project Healing Waters and um, there's Fishing the Good Fight and all these programs focus on how to repair traumatic or stress through fly fishing. And so obviously we can't forget that kids in the foster in foster care have a huge amount of stress in their life. More so than they should they shouldn't. They should just be kids. And I think it's great that the Mayfly project is able is capable of bringing the kids outdoors and just to kind of forget about it all. Um Rebecca, do you have one of your favorite one of your favorite memories with the kids on the water? Absolutely I do. Um they're all so touching <laughs> and they're all so <laughs> special. Um, I'm going to try to pick one though. That doesn't make me emotional. I'm not trying to cry tonight. <laughs> <laughs> but, it's okay to cry. Uh, I cry. I've cried before <laughs> all the time, actually. Right. <laughs> yeah, me too. I'm just an emotional <laughs> being. Me um, too. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Jess is like, Oh gosh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> yeah, all the Mayfly thing, Project but... employees are women, so like I'm, I'm right here with you guys. I'll cry <laughs> oh, with good. you. Oh, good. Oh man, I think you know this past um, this last season when we did it last year. You know, we had we had three uh, siblings that they were all lucky to be adopted together, and. Um, they're all so different, you know, like we all are with our own different personalities. 
but um outing after outing after outing these three kids were getting into it unlike any other kids i've seen and it was a really awesome experience to watch them bond together as siblings me and my siblings we we fish together and so like I, I know what that personally means on a like you know on a deep level what it means to share something like that with somebody in your family and, and these kids they they just have each other and they've been fortunate to keep each other and you know their their attitudes their perspective on everything um it was just so it was so happy they were so stinking happy and outing after outing they would now they would come with, with their personal backpacks and now their personal backpacks had those badges that Jess was talking about and so these are the backpacks that they take to school so you could see that they were so proud of what they were doing in this program as far as implementing it in, you know into their personal life and um, you know man you know getting getting a big thank you and a big hug at the very end of the program on our very last outing from those three kids was just like the best talk i've ever received and um you know it, it was just uh they were just saying you know thank you so much for teaching us you know how to fish and they were so excited and um uh, you know, till this day, we have a mentor, their lead mentor that was with them. He takes them out fishing and, um, you know, we're working on scheduling a couple more outings with them. Um, and it's, it's, it's incredible. That last day, I, I can't, we, when we, you know, gave them their rods, there are tears everywhere <laughs> and joy. And, and it was just such an amazing experience. And I think, I think it's not just one outing. I think really it was the journey of those three children progressing through the program together as a little team and this is all you know they've only had each other and now they have this incredible thing to bond over and man that was that was something special well there's nothing like your sisters and brothers and I mean my sisters are my best friends so to experience something like that must have been mm -hmm. just so special to witness that kind of bonding um, right on the water I know you talked about um, the, st the the project. What does that exactly look like? How many stages are there? Is it like a day thing? Is it a month? Um, how how does that how does the Mayfly project uh, stages work? The really awesome thing is we all um, all of the chapters kind of have a little bit of flexibility in it, but we all kind of follow the basic guidelines. So um, there can, you know, depending on the program, there can be four to six outings and or more or less, uh, depending on on how it's structured. And we cover all kinds of different things. We cover entomology. We cover conservation. We uh, then progress over into, you know, what is a rod? What are the components of it? Mm -hmm. How to properly rig it, how to properly manage your line um so you're in control of the rig that we're teaching you how to put while you're out there we talk a lot about you know reading water where fish live and how to get them different conditions and you know bring it back to okay you know those bugs we learned about well here they are in real life and you know we're, we're gonna implement them or you know take flies and compare them to the naturals and um Proper fish handling is a really big one. Um, yeah. You know, we've got our we've got our big, you know, fun little plastic fish that we use <laughs> as an example. <laughs> we name him Gary. <laughs> we got Gary, <laughs> you know, that we use to you know help you learn how to properly handle the fish and making sure that it gets back safely. And you know, at the end of the day, when we get to enjoy all of that, uh, we love to bring it back to conservation because it's. An, it's important to realize that that three seconds of joy you just felt landing that fish, um, we can continue that on for longer if we, you know, bring it back to conservation. So we, we definitely try to bring it back full circle um, by introducing those different aspects outside of just learning how to fish, you know, all the different components that come into it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. We just actually put together a women's casting event this past weekend and I really wanted to implement the conservation piece and fish handling because I think if you're introducing anybody to the outdoors you have to add a piece of like 
you know, make sure you're respecting this. And this is the reason why we're doing it. You know, um, Jess, do you have one of your favorite, uh, fishing memories? Um, so I would say that probably, uh, my favorite memory or one of my favorite memories, uh, came last year. Uh, we were mentoring and, uh, one of our mentors, his name is Jay Langston and he had, uh, this kid with him, um, and they were fishing and, um, I can't remember exactly how, like it all came up. Um, but Jay was like, you know what? And, and I think his name was Nolan. He was like, you know what, Nolan, like you're, you're, you're super cool. And he was like, well, the kids at school don't think so. And, uh, Jay was like, well, what do you, what do you mean by that? And he was like, well, the kids at school don't think that I'm very cool. And Jay, like Jay had the perfect response. And he was like, well, you know, I've spent all day with you today and I can tell you that those kids at your school were wrong. You know what I mean? And so like for, for, you know, for us growing up, like I, you know, I grew up, uh, in, you know, just, just typical, you know, Southern household, like, um, very, you know, loved and all this stuff. But like, I mean, you can remember as a teenager, you know, if you felt like somebody didn't like you or, um, you know, you were kind of on the outs or you weren't, you know, fitting in or whatever. And like to just have somebody, um, like an adult who, you know, um, no one I'm sure was looking up to Jay, like say something like that to him. I don't know. It was just a, it was a really special moment that I overheard, you know what I mean? And I was like, man, like I really actually bet that made that kid's day, you know? And so it's just a bunch of little moments like that, you know, like I can think of a thousand of them, you know, but for some reason, like, you know, Jay's response to that was perfect, right? Like, well, I can tell you, like, I've spent all day with you and those kids at school are wrong. You know what I mean? Like, you're a super cool dude. And he was like, really? Thanks. You know what I mean? Like, it was just, I don't know, like, you know, that day, you know, no one just needed to hear those words of encouragement. You know what I mean? And they were all just standing on a dock trying to catch a brim, you know? So some of my, my best memories are with my dad or with somebody I looked up to fishing as a kid, you know what I mean? And so I, I think that they'll both remember that conversation forever. Cause I know I still remember it like a year later, you know? Oh my gosh. I mean, that's even tearing me up right now. Cause words can carry a heavy weight and just even hearing, cause I mean, gosh, you're just, you know, being little or younger, you know, when, if you thought someone was really cool and you idolized them and someone told you you were cool, I couldn't even imagine this day and age. I mean, as we yeah. get older, there's so much more social media. Everything mm-hmm. is instant and uh, words are instant. And I can't, I imagine that these kids are also having the weight of COVID mm-hmm. through that stress that we have social media, the stressors and pros and cons to everything, right? But um, for younger kids, it can be a, a scary place, especially if you don't feel like you're having the support or somebody who thinks you're cool. Mm-hmm. So that was a really touching, touching story, Jess. Um, I was just curious when people are wanting to, because I, I mean, I saw that there's always um, on your website, volunteer. So like I was on Missoula, I think we have Karen Flint here in Missoula that is a lead mentor. And I think it's great that even on there, you guys show how many kids you've um, taken on the water. And I think that's so amazing. So as anyone who's listening and is wanting to become more part of the Mayfly project, um, how, how do they do that? Yeah. So just like you were talking about, Lauren, they can just go to our website, which is the mayflyproject.com and we have an interactive map that show where all of our projects are so you can see if there's one near you and you can actually apply to mentor to that project um, and then if there's not one near you you can um, request to start a new project uh, we try to only start like five to seven new projects a year um, we're currently booked out for 2023 and taking projects for 2024 so we're like we have a backlog of um of projects, but yeah, so you can just go online and apply online, and uh, we will it'll it'll direct you to this link to set up a phone call, and we'll interview you, and we'll you know check your references, you know take your blood, get a life insurance policy, take <laughs> now we won't do all that stuff, but we will we will check references and do all that stuff. Um, 
but yeah, and then you know, and then we kind of hook you up with your lead mentor, and then your lead mentor kind of takes it from there. Awesome. And you said um, because do these uh, projects do they happen a specific day and time, or does it kind of just depend on your lead mentor? Yeah, it kind of depends on where they're at. And just to kind of echo Rebecca, you know, like every project's different. Finding kids are different. You know, seasons are different. We actually have some projects that have already finished their last outing and we haven't even started our first one here in Arkansas. You know what I mean? So it's like, it kind of used to be where they were all on the same track and then now they just, you know, whenever the fishing's good and whenever the mentors can do it, you know, like it's going on. It's year round now. There's no off season anymore. (laughs) Nice. Rebecca, when's your first outing? Or has it already happened? It has not happened. We're actually in the most important stage and that is finding these kids. Um, we are we are working really hard to getting these kids put together so we can start this project in the fall. And we have had a few applications come in, but we're still you know we still have six positions open. And so if anybody is listening and knows of any you know contacts or of any kids that would like to participate um, throughout Utah, please don't hesitate to reach out because we would absolutely love to give these kids that opportunity and like he was saying we're all in different stages and right now we're in we're in go mode (laughs) we are are searching emailing calling we're all over the place (laughs) hello because how many do you cap it at rebecca eight Um, eight or ten ten is like max and then eight is, is i'd say pretty standard Eight's a good one. We had 10 ladies and I think I was like kept repeating myself and then I would come over to the other end and the other ones were done and I was like, oh my gosh, like what are you guys doing over here? And they looked at me. I'm like, all right, we're going to do a blood knot. So eight is eight is a great number. It is. The 10 it one, I don't know what is. happened. <laughs> just, just like jumping from kid number two to three, right, Jess? Mm-hmm. That's right. That's right. Like, Third kid will throw you handled. for a loop. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Absolutely. So, um, Jess, as you have so many listeners probably listening to this podcast, what do you want them to leave this podcast about why they should be maybe volunteer some time at the Mayfly Project? Um, So that's a good question, Lauren. So I feel like, um, you know, that our most vulnerable population in the United States are, are kids without parents, right? Like there's all these statistics about, you know, um, what happens to foster kids, right? When they age out, like, um, I used to know the stats on the top of my head, but you know, they, you know, I think it's like 18% end up homeless. You know what I mean? Like all of these different statistics, you know, because once they age out, Typically, they don't have a whole lot of support. There are some states that have support till they're 21, but it just kind of depends on the state. Um, So, you know, our most vulnerable population in the U.S., you know, kids without parents, you know, um, connecting with the most um, passionate people, right? Fly fishermen, right? Like fly fishermen are passionate people. So Mm -hmm. I'm a a firm believer that when you, you know, when you get a, a fly fisherman and a foster kid together in, in a river, like special things happen. You know, there, there are so many of us who, you know, look up to people. Um, even today I have people that I look up to, right, that are teaching me different things about fly fishing. You know what I mean? Like, um, mm-hmm. you know, I'm, I'm constantly, you know, I have people that I look up to that, you know, and, and, and we need that. Like our kids need that, right? Mm-hmm. There's 450,000 foster kids. You know what I'm saying? And it's a cycle. You know, the, the, you know, most likely their parents were in, in foster care. You know, if they, you know, when they age out, you know, I mean, it's just a cycle, you know? And so if you can, if you can try to break the cycle, you know what I mean? Like, you know, I know that's a lot of kids, right? And, and, you know, we have a thousand mentors, right? We need, you know, 449 more thousand, right? To be able to mentor (laughs) one-on-one, you know, more mentors, but, you know, um, and two, I just, I firmly believe that, like, changing a kid's life, like, um, you know, no matter what happens to that kid, right, after we get done mentoring, no matter where life takes them, they'll always have that fly rod, right? And that river will always be their home, you know? So that's kind of, that's the way that, you know, when I used to travel, I used to travel, I was an auditor, and no matter where I went, I would always take my fly rod, you know what I mean? And so we hope those kids kind of do that same thing, right? Like, no matter where life takes them the foster care system takes them 
you know, adoption takes them, like they'll always have their fly rod and they'll be able to find a home on the water, you know? And so, um, you know, and again, you know, like Rebecca was talking about, you know, we teach these kids, you know, cat, we teach them conservation, we teach them, you know, cleaning rivers, um, we teach them, you know, catch and release, um, and, you know, we, we keep our rivers clean. And so, you know, these kids are also learning to be good stewards of our, of our rivers, you know, and they'll take care of them. And so, um, you know, you start them young and I'm, I'm a firm believer that good things can happen um, and you can, you can really change a kid's life. Oh, absolutely. Well, and like you said, you said that there's a special bond with a fly fishing guide and a student. Um, Rebecca, you're a fly fishing guide. Do you feel that kind of special bond? All the time. <laughs> All the time. Even with the ones that don't accept me at first because, you know, they hire you, but they don't need your help. <laughs> but they hired yeah. you, <laughs> so they kind of right. do. Um, but you feel it, 1,000%. It's really fun. I've, you know, I've got stories for days with just clients that have just completely touched my heart, you know, in, in ways I did not expect the moment we met on the river. It's pretty amazing. I love, I love that. Well, um, what is, Jess, what is the best way for um, our listeners to follow the Mayfly Project, learn more? Um, yeah, so I would say uh, probably, you know, um, if you want information, definitely go to our website. We have tons of information on, you know, again, where projects are located, what we do, you know, what the buttons look like, um, you know, all of that good stuff. Um, you know, if you're just wanting to look at cool pictures, we hired a new social media person, so... That's amazing because I'm terrible at it. Um, so yeah, so you know, Instagram, Facebook, obviously. Um, I have not started uh, TikTok dancing yet, but I will <laughs> if you know if it'll get more kids out. Um, so yeah, we don't have a TikTok yet, but we're on our way. Oh my gosh, I TikTok at the beginning. I was like, that is the that is the silliest thing ever. <laughs> now all of a sudden, I'm trying to do. I'm like, Justin, come on, let's do this TikTok dance. <laughs> Justin's like, what are you talking about? I was like obsessed with the cry emoji for a while. It was it was bad. Nothing funny, but oh gosh. But before we say um, say goodbye, Rebecca, I would love to end the podcast with one more fishing story. Oh, and I know you have some. <laughs> oh, personal or mayfly? Hey, whatever, whatever personal favorite memorable one on the river because these kids are coming with favorite fishing stories so you must have a great fishing story i do have one there's one that, that comes to mind um so my husband and i were fishing this uh really small creek and we got into a sizable fish um it was a lot bigger for that that particular stream so it kind of wowed us you know we kind of stared at it for a minute on the net and we're like that's awesome like that is so cool that that that's here. It's amazing to know. And, um, you know, we've always done our best to practice, like, safe handling. And especially if you're taking a picture, making it a very fast process. But this day, it became even quicker because when I went to bring the fish up from the net, um, for the very first time since I had started fishing, I, I felt the fish's heartbeat throb through my hand. Um, that is not something I have ever felt before. So from that day forward, um, and that was probably like seven years ago, um, my respect for them is so much greater. It's super unfortunate that it, it took that for me to realize this is a live animal in my hands. Um, but the appreciation for the fish and its life cycle and where I come into play with it and all of that stuff. Um, just what an extremely humbling experience. Uh, this, is, it, it's, this isn't just for play. Um, there's a lot that goes into it and you, you do have to, you know, be careful as to how you handle it and how you fight it. Um, but uh, feeling that experience completely changed my life and it's a, it's a huge reason as to why I'm so dedicated to fish, con fish conservation and um, you know proper fish handling and uh, making that like a major focus in our programs here and of course like with anybody that we take out in the water um, yeah it's a quick reminder that what you're 
what you have in your hands is a life. And it's so for some reason it just didn't it, it clicked before, but not in such a deep level when you when I just felt that throbbing in my hand. It was incredible. That was to this that, day my most favorite memory on the water. That is such a beautiful story. Thank you. And I've I don't <laughs> and now that you say that out loud, I'm like, have I heard have I ever felt a fish's heartbeat and I'm mm-hmm. positive I haven't so what a special so memory oh, and I, I think yeah. as you kind of <laughs> I think there's also an evolution in ourselves as fly anglers um, with the way that we respect the waters mm-hmm. right when you first get into it you're like I'm not catching any mm-hmm. fish this is the worst <laughs> and then after a while you like catch fish and you're like how do I respect this fish in its life and and it's my gratitude for it too you mm-hmm. know you're like I just want to send it back home so it can go back and live a healthy life like I don't want to go there and you know like I think that's so great that you guys are teaching these kids at such a young age because I bet they will flourish in it or maybe they pick it up later right uh-huh, absolutely. maybe like you you know as you start getting older and you have these anxieties and you're like you know what time in my life what can I reflect on that helped me in the past mm-hmm. and the Mayfly project will be definitely something they're like you know what that was kind of awesome I was Maybe I need to go pick up that rod again that I have and go outside. I truly believe that because we we see that with our TU chapters all the time. We have people that, you know, they they haven't fished. They haven't fished since they were kids, children. And they're just like, I just want to get back into it. And now they're just like these hardcore fishermen. There was this gap of maybe 15, 30 years, but here they are. (laughs) Avid anglers, you know, it's, it's incredible. Go to thefebruaryroom.com where you can access a complete library of our podcast and read more about our guests, their fishing stories, and favorite fly patterns. We're always looking for exceptional fly fishing yarns, and if you have one to spin, shoot us an email at info at thefebruaryroom.com. The February Room is always free, but if you feel like throwing a nickel in the pond, we appreciate any additional listener support. For companies and individuals interested in sponsorship opportunities, please contact us for our media kit. Thanks for stopping by the February Room, and we'll see you down here next week.